that you'll be for us, Lord, wherever we're going through. So, Lord, I'm just pray now for each one of us in this place. So, whoever's watching online, Lord, maybe today or during the week, that they would know your presence right where they are. That they would, Holy Spirit, that they would feel your presence, that they would know that you're there. Bless you. So, Lord Jesus, just come and have your way, we pray. Holy Spirit, you are God come in this place. Move amongst us, Lord. Be fresh as Lord, I pray. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Shall we sing cornerstone?
great to worship our Lord. Put him right in the midst of our gathering. And we praise him because he is worthy of all our praise. Blessed be his name. Thank you for joining us this evening and uh, we do pray that God's blessing it's good to have you here in person and those who have joined us online. Uh, some international connections again tonight. Jill out in Barcelona and uh, 
favour from Nigeria, as well as those in our locality, and Derek from Birmingham as well, but not in Birmingham, down here. Oh, farmers. Swansea. I think, I think it's this the weekend he was supposed to be there. So there we go. And it's always good to invite the Holy Spirit into our gathering so that we can enjoy our worship as he encourages us, as he lifts us up, as he reminds us of what Jesus has done for us and what our God is to us. And as that happens, it's almost an automatic switch that switches us on to be able to thank our God. Praise his name. Uh, plus we can have the notices. Ah, there we are. Well done, on the spot. Uh, so Wednesday we have our prayer and share, Zoom online, at 6.15 for 6.30, back to that time. And then on Thursday we have our growth group online meeting, and that's going to be interesting, because I'm not going to be there, because I've got a street pastor uh, event to attend. So I'm going to be putting it on down there in the hope that you'll be able to connect so we'll see how that works. I'm sure it will work. Uh, getting dab at these things now. So we'll see how that works. Um, so we invite you to come to that. And then on Sunday, 11 o'clock, Destiny Online Service. Uh, the <coughs> in-person service here at 6 o'clock. There won't be a live stream next Sunday because again, I'm away uh, doing a, a commissioning service for street pastors down in Cadfilly. So we've got a new team members there, which I have to uh, do the commissioning service for. So value of press for that. So that's what's happening this week. So praise God for that. I don't think there's anything else there. Mm -hmm. So let's have our prayer points. And if anybody would like to pray, do come forward and uh, so that everybody can hear and see you. So, we've got a, a few on the list this evening. Paul and Hazel, we need to continue to pray for them. Pray again for favour out in Nigeria. Having a tough time out there. She needs our help in prayer. Uh, as many, many of you can do that, that'll be great. Uh, pray for Derek, who we just said is on line tonight. Continue to pray for him. Gary and Angwin, they're on the high seas. I think it's Tenerife they're in now or get in there nearby. Uh, <clears throat> continue to pray for Marl. Spoke to Marl earlier. He's still struggling a bit, so he needs our prayer. And then we need to pray for Chris and family. Uh, Chris's dad's funeral was last Thursday, but we surely <coughs> need our prayers at this time. Um, and pray for my folks. Marie uh, and Michael came home yesterday. Uh, she'd been in a couple of days uh, after the birth, so if you could pray for Marie, Michael and James. Uh, she had to have a caesarean, so she'd been in a lot of pain, etc. Yeah. Um, Michael, though, is doing well, apparently, and I'm going to see him this week. Well, sometime. <laughs> so there we are. No, <clears throat> we need to continue to pray for others. Bill Penny's family, um, he died this week. His wife died this week, so we need to pray for the family. Sean Buffin's family, Sean had an accident which ended up in, in dying. So we need to pray for the family. Pray for Lisa's mum, Phyllis. Still a lot of pain with the back, etc. And sciatica, etc. And of course, we need to continue to remember the Ukraine crisis. Um, the Ukraine people are so resilient, don't they? Yeah. Uh, and we're hearing all sorts of messages coming out of the Kremlin, uh, messages from Russia as well, that uh, Putin is a madman, and he's not a very well man, and he needs to be removed. Yes. Yes. But let's pray for those, you know, yes. indiscriminate yes. bombing, Families, children, yes. you know, just not on, not on in the state world. So let's remember them. So if anybody would like to come forward, even if it's just to pray for one person, do come now. 
please. Who's going to be first? Anyone? Thanks, Pete. Father, I'd just like to say in the house of the Lord today, there's many of us in dire need of food bank, Christians against poverty, and many, many other things. But most of all, Lord, we're in dire need of you, your strength, your guidance, to bring us into your world, into your pastures, and also the people who are suffering in this world. It's not just the Ukraine, it's all over. You've got Pakistan, you've got Nigeria, you've got parts of Africa, slavery, um, trafficking, all over the world. Lord. It's people who have obviously gone down the wrong path and they need your guidance and they need your strength to rebuild themselves and better themselves. Lord. So I'd just like to say for the people in our congregation and our church who are ill at the moment, and unwell and haven't been in church for a long time I'd just like to say that we are with you we are here to guide you and strength give you the strength that you need and put you back on a righteous path Amen Any others? Father God we just thank you that we come into a God who hears and answers our prayers. We bless you, Lord, that you're interested in every single person that we've mentioned this evening. We pray for those families who are in mourning, who are bereaved from loved ones, even those in the last few days who have lost loved ones. Lord, we lift them before you. You are the one who can bring comfort and can bring peace into their situations. Yes. Yes. We pray for those that need a touch in their body. Lord, you are the great healer, the great physician. And so we thank you, Lord, that we can come with boldness and ask that you might reach out and touch people at this time. Bless you. Lord, you know the ones that we've mentioned already. You know the ones that we are, they're continually in our prayers. We just thank you for them. And we pray that they will know that deliverance from sickness, deliverance from the things that they need at this time, Lord. We pray that you will just move into their lives and reach out and touch them. Lord, others that we need to pray for, for their situation, wherever they are, whether it's in this country or far and wide, we bless you that you know each situation and you can deal with those things. And Lord, yes, we do pray for the continual crisis of war out in the East, Eastern Europe. And Lord, we pray that you will bring this to a close very quickly. Lord, we know that the Russians want to celebrate on Monday, tomorrow, their Liberation Day, but this war has been a strange war where it doesn't appear that they have won at all. There's so much resilience from those Ukrainian people. And we pray for those who have lost their lives especially those families and the children that have been bombed upon. Lord, in this day and age, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't happen. Lord, you have mentioned so many times in scripture that we need to pray for peace. And yes, Lord, we thank you. You are the Prince of Peace. And so, Lord, we pray that you will see fit, Lord, to bring in this uh, war and crisis to a close, Lord. Lord, speak to that man, uh, Putin, Lord. And Lord, may he take uh, orders now, Lord, to orders to his soldiers and, and, and his army to stop everything. Lord, 
we pray that there won't be anything more in his mind what he wants to do lord at the end of the day save his soul lord we pray these things in your precious name the name of jesus amen, amen. We're going to have a reading this evening that's uh, found in Nehemiah. But before I do that, I'd like to do a little quiz. I'm going to have a quiz for a while. Let's see what you, what you know. Now then, this is a new test for you. I'll give you a hint. All the questions have to do with the Old Testament. So, who was the greatest comedian in the Bible? Any ideas? Who was the greatest comedian in the Bible? No. Well, of course, it was Samson because he brought the house down. <laughs> Who was the greatest male financier in the Bible? The greatest male financier. Any idea? No. Could have been, no? Because he was the richest. But a financier. Is that your lawyer? No. Well, it was Noah. Because he was floating his stock while everyone else was in liquidation. I think you're getting the idea now. Yes. Who was the greatest female financier? You've done the male female financier. No, it's white. Sorry? No, it's white. Well, sorry? No. She's not in the Bible. <laughs> well, it was Pharaoh's daughter because she went down to the bank of the Nile and drew out a little prophet. <laughs> Who was the greatest babysitter mentioned in the Bible? Babysitter mentioned babysitter. in the Bible. God? No. Any ideas? No. Well, it was David. I said he was a man. I knew it. Because he rocked Goliath to a very deep sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and you should know this one. Who was the shortest man in the Bible? In fact, there's two. The first one was Bildad the shoe height. Oh gosh, I see that. And who are we going to talk about tonight? Nehemiah. Oh, <laughs> so there we are. <laughs> Did we win? No. Oh man. You didn't have any right. Okay. They said a man on the end, but I didn't know his name was David. I hope you did better online. <laughs> Well, tonight we're going to be continuing on with our series of prayers that made a difference. And tonight we're going to look at Nehemiah. Uh, it's such a lengthy one that I've decided to do it in two parts. So we'll have part one this time and part two next time. Nehemiah is one of the greatest characters in the Old Testament. One of the greatest but perhaps he's not as well known as some others that we've looked at already. So we need to put briefly into context the history of how Nehemiah came on the scene. Because again, he was God's man coming into a situation to do a job. 
So in Genesis chapter 12, if you look there, God calls Abram to leave his country and to follow him to another land. We know that story. And as Abram obeyed, his descendants multiplied. And the Israelites were then later enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. I don't know if you were aware of that. It wasn't a short time they were in Egypt, 400 years, a long time. And they were there until God called them out under the leadership of Moses. That's right. And eventually, we know the story, they were allowed to enter the land that God had promised them. Canaan. A land flowing with milk and honey. Hundreds of years then passed during which the nation experienced struggles, faithlessness and wrestling with God. That's what happened. And the high point of Israel's history came when David came on the scene many years after. He was a godly king and he was called to sit on the throne. And for only 40 years, David expanded the nation in both breadth of influence in those days and, thank God, expanded the people's knowledge of their God. But unfortunately, as we know from many story in scripture things went downhill from there tribes were expanding etc but you know after david's son king solomon died israel was split into two kingdoms the northern kingdom which had 10 tribes and was referred to as israel and then the southern kingdom had only two tribes and they were referred to as Judah. And because of their disobedience, the Assyrians conquered Israel and the ten tribes were scattered. And then, if you know your scriptures, they became known as the ten lost tribes of Israel. Even though the southern kingdom and southern tribes saw all this happening, they too continued to rebel against God. And in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army captured the Jews. Jerusalem was destroyed, the walls were knocked down, and the temple was burnt. The people were deported and were forced into slavery again. And their history had come right full circle. The city was left in ruins. And it must have been a very traumatic time and thing for the Jews to see death and destruction and then be forced to leave their homeland and to travel about a thousand miles to a foreign country. And many of God's prophets predicted that the captivity would not destroy the nation, but it would eventually end, thank God. And the people would be allowed to go back home again. Daniel understood this truth when he was reading the book of Jeremiah. Do you know, God didn't forsake his people. And I thank God that he doesn't forsake us today. He's interested in us. We don't deserve his attention because we are like we are. But God did not forsake his people. He allowed the Persians to take over the Babylonians and he moved King Cyrus to make a decree 
to let some of the Jews return. And in three stages over about a hundred years, they were allowed to migrate back to Jerusalem, only to discover the city was still demolished and desolate. I don't know if you've been watching pictures on the telly of those Ukrainian towns and villages that had just been bombed about. That was the sort of desolation that Jerusalem found themselves in. Very interesting. Living there was dangerous. Just reminds us again. People are hiding away. Dangerous. It was difficult and it was sorrowful. And after Cyrus had decreed 50,000 Israelites returned to Ju Judah with Zerubbabel, I don't know if you remember that guy, and began rebuilding the temple. Unfortunately, they got discouraged and they quit. And then God sent them the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to encourage them to finish the project. And he sent also Ezra, a key person, help, to help the people to restore their particular spiritual fervor. And if you know a lot about when Nehemiah came, Ezra opened up the scriptures and reminded the people of their God. Sometimes we need that. When we're in difficulties, when we're in trouble, we need to open up the scriptures Amen. and we need to understand what God has done, what he wants to do, yes. and what he wants to change in our lives. Absolutely. It's very important to do that. So finally, Nehemiah tells his story in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes. By now, Persia had replaced Babylon as the region's great power. So it was Persians who were in charge. And the Persians ruled with a very different means of control. And the commitment of the Persians was to resettle the captured people in their native lands. They conquered peoples uh, the conquered peoples, rather, could act with a decree of autonomy. So they had a little bit of a, a chance to do things themselves. If they'd continued under the Babylonians, they would be almost squashed. But the Persians gave them that sort of sense of, of it, <coughs> being able to do their own thing. And as we start the book of Nehemiah, God is about to instigate another movement back to the promised land. Isn't that interesting? This is the second time that God takes his people back to the promised land. And the book falls into several divisions. If you look at Nehemiah, the first six chapters are about the rebuilding of the wall. Then chapter 7 through to 10 deal with the renewing of worship again in Jerusalem and the final chapters deal with the addressing of the repopulation and the revival of God's people and I like all that because that is exactly what God is doing today yeah. he is bringing us into a chance where we perhaps left him before but he's given us the opportunity to come back, to rebuild the walls, rebuild our own lives. Then he comes to renew the worship within our hearts so that we start to acknowledge him. And then last of all, we know his reviving power. Yes. And I tell you, I don't know about you, but I want to see that happen again yes. with God's people. <laughs> because we need to do that. We need to have that in our experience. So, let's have a look at Nehemiah. 
when it comes to the book of Nehemiah, prayer is one of the overriding themes of the book and is the secret to Nehemiah's success. The prayer in chapter 1 is the first of 12 different prayers recorded in the book. It begins with a prayer in Persia and it closes with prayer in Jerusalem and Nehemiah's prayers are filled with adoration in chapters 8 and 9, thanksgiving in chapter 12, confession in chapter 1 and 9, petition in chapters 1 and 2, and there are prayers of anguish, there are prayers of joy, there are prayers of protection, there are prayers of dependence and commitment. Now you see, we ain't able to finish that tonight. <clears throat> it's the story of compassionate, persistent, personal and corporate prayer. And we're only going to look at one tonight, and that's uh, all about the concern that Nehemiah had. So, let's have a little read of Nehemiah chapter 1 and verses 1 to 11. Uh, you got it up there? Great. Uh, I should have got it ready here, and I haven't. So just bear with me a second while I go into it, and uh, we'll have it up soon. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. So, the words of Nehemiah, son of Halkaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year, while I was in the citadel of Sibza, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself, and my father's family have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather, gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today 
by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cup bearer to the king. What a prayer. What an amazing prayer. Oh, so I want to suggest tonight that Nehemiah went through a process of prayer that has great application and relevance to us today. The first place Nehemiah started was with a concern about the problem in verses 1 to 4. And that's all we're going to do tonight. You see, we've got to remind ourselves that when us as God's people turn away from God and get involved with other things, other worldly things, we've got to understand and be concerned about what is happening to us as individuals and us corporately. Because if we don't understand and be concerned about something, then there's no way we're going to change that. So let's have a look at what the problem was. We know from verse 11, he makes it quite clear that he was the cup bearer to the king. We know what that meant. He was to taste the wine before the king drank it. If that wine had been poisoned, he would surely die. So it was a very responsible position. And as cupbearer, Nehemiah, he had a great job because he had intimate access to royalty. Now, how many of us are able to hop in and see the Queen? Thank you. I ask you later how you do it. <laughs> we don't have that access, do we? But I trust that we have access to the King of Kings. Yes. Because that is so important. So he had intimate access to royalty. He had political standing. And he had a place to live in the palace. How would you like a room in back, back house? You know, it would be wonderful. Better oldish, perhaps, but who cares? Wonderful. Well, it was a cushy job that provided everything that he needed. And yet, one of his brothers returns from a road trip to Jerusalem and in verse 2 says that in Nehemiah it says there he questioned them rather Nehemiah questioned his brother about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem the word question there means to inquire or demand an answer that's why it's so important. We need to demand an answer. And Nehemiah was greatly concerned about what was happening in Jerusalem. And he could have protected himself if he chose to, but he didn't. He sought them out and wanted to hear the first-hand report of what had happened. And you know that's a very important starting point it's so easy for us to say, stay uh, unresolved with the answers that we want we can easily put it to the side and not care for things some of us don't want to even think about stuff that's going on in our own lives much less to take the time to investigate what is happening in the lives of others. Do you care about yourself? Do you care about what is going on in your life? We need to. Let's not point to other people because we see what they're doing. 
Let's sort ourselves out first. That is important. Nehemiah had never been to Jerusalem. He had heard stories about it, and he knew that his ancestors had been led away in chains and that Babylon had destroyed it. And as he thought on Jerusalem, he listened to the report in verse 3 that the survivors were in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem, the walls around Jerusalem were in shambles. His gate, the, the gates had been burned with fire. And as he tried to imagine the shame in the city of David, he could barely stand it. The phrase is used there, great trouble. And it meant that the people had broken down and they were falling to pieces. Because it wasn't just the physical city, it was the people in the city. <coughs> and Nehemiah was broken. He was broken of the complacency of the people of Jerusalem. They were living in ruins. And they accepted it. I don't know if you live in ruins. My house needs a, a bit of a, a move on. But you know, we can get so used to things, can't we? Yes. Living like we think it's fine. Amazing. They were willing to walk around the devastation instead of being concerned enough to do something about their situation. Can I say, nothing is ever going to change in your life, in the life of this church even, or for that matter, our nation, until we become concerned about the problem. Yeah, yeah. Some of us have become complacent. I think in this day and age, the church should have a voice in our nation. But very often, we've let things go. And then we worry and then we get concerned about what is happening around us, about the secularism of society in this day and age. I can only point the finger to ourselves. Yeah. We haven't been strong enough over the years. We haven't been witnesses enough over the years. And we've allowed the enemy to get in. And we're on the back track now. Because if we say something out of place, we are caught up and held before the courts. Another chap was uh, in the courts just recently because he said something out that offended certain people. And this is the situation. We need to be concerned about things. We've become complacent if we're living in rubble and it doesn't bother us anymore then there's something wrong something really wrong are we ready to allow God to do some rebuilding that's the question we need to answer if so we need to become concerned about the problem by listening to the facts, even sometimes if we don't want to hear them. Yeah, yeah. So when Nehemiah heard this report, he hit the ground and began to weep. If there was ever a time that the church needs to hit the ground on their knees in prayer, it's now. That's what we need to do. So when he heard this report, he hits the ground and he begins to weep. And the meaning behind these verses around here, this word, is that he bemoaned and he lamented. Much like Jesus did when he cried out in painful tears, when he, did, when he actually saw the hardened hearts of those in Jerusalem many years 
ahead. Nehemiah also fasted, so he meant business. And in the Old Testament, fasting was only required once a year. But here we see Nehemiah refraining from food for several days. In fact, we know from comparing the different dates in this book that he wept, fasted, and he prayed for four months. He meant business. And so do we need to. These are all signs of humility and show the deep concern for the problem. So I'm just going to finish there and challenge us tonight to say, do we need some rebuilding tonight? Whether it's in our own life, whether it's in our church, certainly within our nation, we need rebuilding. Are our defenses broken down such that we are allowing these practices and sins to control what's going on in our own lives, in our church, and in our nation. Before we can ask God to rebuild, we must first become concerned about the problem. So if there's anything else that we need to understand tonight, let's understand that. If we're concerned enough about ourselves, then we need God to deal with it. So whether you're in this gathering, whether you're online this evening, that is the question. Will you allow God to rebuild your life? Your life is probably in a bit of a mess. You put on the face and you show others that everything's hunky-dory. But deep within, you know that your life is not. We can kid each other, but we certainly can't kid God. And so that's the challenge this evening. And we'll hear next time when I preach, we'll hear a little bit more about Nehemiah. He was a man of prayer and he was a man of who prayed the prayer that made a difference. I don't know about you, but I want to feel that difference in my life, in the church, and certainly in our nation. So let's allow him to do that. If you're online and you want to know more about that, then please do get in touch. There will be a further broadcasting of this program this evening and there will be details at the end where you can connect with us if you want Jesus to reconstruct your life you can have that tonight we'd love to help you we'd love to send you a little booklet called this is for you which will explain a little bit more about what you need to do to know God in your life and experience Let's thank you. Father God, we thank you that you are still in the business of rebuilding. And you can rebuild our lives, you can rebuild our church life as well as this nation. Lord, we want to pray a prayer that will make a difference. Not in years ahead, but right now in the days to come, in the months to come, which will lead to many years ahead. Lord, we pray that you will just challenge our hearts. Help us not to be complacent, but that you might bless us in a real way. For we ask it in your precious name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We can ask our band now to play the final song. Thank you. <coughs> Should we stand and sing our final?
just bless you and we just praise you. Lord, we just give ourselves afresh to you right now. We thank you for challenging our hearts. Help us to put things right. Help us not to be complacent, but to be really in tune with you and be able to share 
our vibrant faith with others around us. We pray blessing upon your church, blessing upon those who have watched this evening and who will watch this program later in the week or the weeks to come. We just give ourselves afresh to you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us and we do pray that you'll join us again. Next week we won't be on live stream but certainly the week after. God bless you.